Uh, so we've got most of you in here. Good evening to you all. Um, for those who celebrate Hanukkah Sameach, happy Hanukkah. Um, we're now on our fourth night and um, we hope that you're enjoying it with lots of um, latkes and donuts, sufganiyot um, and, and radle spinning. Um, so I can see some names who have been here before with us, who have joined us for one or more of, of, of these online events. So welcome back to those who have been with us before and welcome to any anyone who's 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 who for who this evening is it's their first time with us. Um, on behalf of us, the Zionist Federation and the WZO, the World Zionist Organization here in the UK, we welcome you to this um, to this event, which will really focus on on a on a miracle, and Hanukkah, as we know, is all about miracles. Um, we're delighted to have this evening with us two very special guests. But before I get on to that, um, I'd like to just share with you uh, an appeal that we are running at the moment. Um, many of you, all of you, might know that the ZF is entirely privately funded. We are a non-profit organisation, and so we do rely heavily on donations and the generosity of people who, who, who support Zionism, who stand with Israel um, and, and want to see um, more celebrations of Zionism in Israel here in the UK and in Ireland. So if you just bear with me for a moment, our appeal is about um, eight reasons why you should support the Zionist Federation. I will follow this up tomorrow in our email with the recording of this event this evening. Um, and if you find yourselves able to, we would welcome any donation that you're able to give. I'll share the, the website out in the chat this evening. Um, I'll quickly just talk through the, the eight reasons. So the ZF, I'll go, I'll go from um, I'll go from the eighth candle backwards. The ZF is the oldest Zionist organization in the UK and Ireland. We were created in 1899. We were formally named in the Balfour Declaration. Lord Balfour specifically in his closing sentence named us as the intended recipients. We are constantly showcasing Israeli culture and innovation here in the UK and Ireland. We are uh, obviously COVID aside, although even during COVID, we've remained the organizers of the largest um, uh, rallies in support of Israel, where we had one in the earlier part of this year when, when things flared up in Gaza during the Guardian of the Walls operation. Um, then flipping over onto the other side of the middle candle, we are the organizers and we hosts of the biggest Yom Hatzma'ut celebrations in Europe. We also work very closely with Christian communities across the country in advocating for Israel. We do, and we, we intend to resurrect them, please God, next year, um, eye-opening group trips showing the real Israel. And lastly, but not least, we are a very small office team, but we have big impact. So for any of you this evening who might like to um, give us some support, please do go to, as you can see down here, www.zionist.org.uk forward slash donate and you can specify as much or as little as you'd like to donate um, and I'll, I'll share that in a moment in the chat facility. So thank you on behalf of us all here at the ZF and Hanukkah Sameach. So um, what I'd like to do now is, is to focus on uh, the reason why you've all joined us this evening, and that is to hear all about one soldier's miracle journey. Um, we have with us this evening former IDF soldier Yoram Eshet, who basically sustained a catastrophic brain injury um, in, in, during service in the Yom Kippur War. Um, he has an amazing and very inspiring story to tell. He has written a book about it, but I'll leave our moderator, also our esteemed moderator, Ian Lucas, to um, tell you all about that together with Yoram. Um, so please sit back, enjoy, take inspiration from this, 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 this eight day period where we focus on, on, on the miracle of the oil that, that was only, only in supply for one day, but it lasted eight days. And let's focus, you know, let's hear about another miracle. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Ian Lucas, who is a former shaliach. 
He was heavily worked with um, Chabonim in, in South Africa, where he's originally from. He's lived on kibbutz in Israel. He's a former IDF soldier himself. Um, many, many other accolades. And so without further ado, I shall pass you over to Ian. Hi, good evening. Chag Samach. Uh, welcome. Um, I feel very privileged to be discussing this incredible story with Yoram. Uh, I don't think Yoram will uh, agree or is a believer in miracles, but I wasn't able to find a better word in my lexicon than the word miraculous. And that's indeed Yoram's story. Now, Yoram Esher, just a little bit of a bio to put it into perspective. Yoram is a full-time professor um, in the Department of Education and Psychology at the Open University in Israel. He is the founder and the director of the Institute of Research Innovation. And you'll see how this fits in as well as we go along. He has a BA in archeology span and MA, um, beg your pardon, a BA in archeology, span I'm gonna read this probably so I don't make mistakes, an MSc in geology from the Hebrew University and a PhD in geology from New York University. Uh, his research follows on, uh, focuses on many, 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 many things. He's published numerous articles, including two books, which we're going to talk about. He also won the um, Yitzhak Sadeh Award, and he's been nominated for many, many other awards, including the, uh, the, the, the Sapphire Award. Um, Yoram was a Tzanchan, a paratrooper, in the Yom Kippur War, in a Yechida, in a unit that was across the canal, behind enemy lines, and we're going to go straight away into the evening. And I would like to set the context by reading a short passage from the book itself. It's been almost a week since we were mobilized, and we are roaming the Sinai Desert in our half tracks, looking for a target to justify our existence. There are those like me who fear the war will be over before they get a to fire a single shot. And there are the old timers who aren't in any rush. Yoram, that's the scene. You take the context for us. Okay. Um, in 1973, it was uh... A child, 23 years old, youngster, 23 years old. I was married, having a two years old child, son, with my wife living in the desert in the Arava Valley, south of the Dead Sea. I was working for the Society for the Protection of Nature at that time, and uh, kind of a field instructor for youngsters who study the environment there. And uh, during the war, I was a paratrooper, as Ian said, and I was in a small group who crossed the Suez Canal in October uh, 15th. If you learn the history of the Yom Kippur War, um, there was uh, Israel managed to reverse the war by crossing this, by sending a small troop, a group of like uh, 200 people paratroopers who crossed the canal in, in rubber boats and started operating behind the Egyptian lines. And I was in this uh, group, in this small group. And after three days, uh, I was injured by a, by a, a, a shell uh, that hit the ground next, right over me. I was, if you show the picture of the injury, uh, yeah, it will Excuse illustrate me. my point. It will save me the need to talk about it. Mm. I was injured very badly in my brain. No, not, not this. This is the book that I wrote about the picture, Steve. This yeah, brain yeah. injury. But if you show the other one, Hold the, on. the one book second. will be served, used as a basis for our conversation. But I yeah. thought this is a nice illustration, a nice. Here you see, this is myself. A few minutes after I was hit by a, by a, uh, by a shell, um, I was hit in my 
brain very badly. Uh, almost all of the right hemisphere of the brain was cut off and it does not exist until today. In addition, I had my left arm injured very badly. And what you don't see here is I had, I had a shrapnel in my lungs and I could not breathe very properly. You can remove the picture now. <laughs> it's like, but I thought it's a nice illustration to my point. The, the injury was very, very um, bad. I was, in fact, I was, I was declared dead. So the main order in the picture is the doctor, the combat uh, doctor that his name is Eliraz, and he basically saved my life by by treating me in the field, although he was. Um, constantly told by others, leave him alone, he's already dead. The, we were under siege without su supplies for already three days, and there was very little that was left for him in the, in the it's not a field hospital, kind of a evacuation place where they evacuated the injured or dead people, and, uh, and he was wasting uh, supplies, medical supplies on a dead man. That was basically what happened there. And, um, and he insisted on treating me, but then I was declared later dead. And uh, after like 12 hours, I, I reached the hospital in a very complicated way. First friends took me on a stretcher, then helicopter, then uh, airplane back to Tel Aviv. And I was then um, in a long surgery, and uh, I don't believe too much in miracles, but <laughs> these are things that I don't understand, but, but I stayed alive. And the special thing about the unique thing about brain injury is that you don't see it. Not right now, you don't see almost, you don't see that I'm half blind. I see only a, a, a crack, a very, narrow field of vision, that's what I have. And you see, don't see that I'm paralyzed on my left side. And in fact, you see almost nothing. And basically you don't see that my brain is not working properly in terms of the ability, the cognitive abilities to do all kinds of, of um, um, cognitive uh, um, operations are uh, very, this is very problematic. For example, after the injury, I lost the ability to read and write. I could not actually decipher the meaning of words. In other words, I could identify letters, but letters were not combined, were not combined into meaningful words. And digits were not combined into meaningful numbers. Sequences were lost, the ability to make a sequence of scissors, for example, I couldn't make it. And, and, and the problem, the major problem is that the identification of these limitations or these injuries is not clear, not to the doctors and not to the injured person. And that's the biggest trick about uh, brain injury. For example, my, the, my limited vision was discovered only a few months later when I started to train my right hand. I was left-handed and I, I started to train my right hand in, in, uh, in writing letters. And I was writing until the middle of the line and then moving back to the beginning of the next line because that is, that is a reflection of my limited vision. And only then they found it out because you don't see it. With amputations, you see exactly what happened. But with a brain injury, you are doomed to spend your life in trying to identify what happened to you. And then in addition, uh, make the decisions of how do you cope with this, with what happened to you. Nobody could tell me how to how to learn reading and writing. I was not able to read and write. In my perception, only because I had to train my hand 
my non-dominant hand, my right hand, uh, uh, in writing letters, only because of that, my ability to read came back. In other words, only by doing things, and none of the doctors was able to talk to me about it or offer these strategies to me. So in other words, this is a situation that there is no prognosis, nothing, nobody can really tell you or give you a real picture of what you will be able to do. They, in the beginning, they even, they suggested that I don't go to study in university because I will fail. There was a, the beginning of the journey is very dark, is very grave, if you want if there's a proper word for it. So this is a good, that's a good opportunity for me to read an extract from the book that sets the context of what you're describing. So let me just read this very quickly. Yeah. And this is a quote directly from the book, of course, right? I'm reading what Joram has written. There is something sly and slippery about, about brain damage. People who lose an arm or a leg understand what has happened to them and begin to function without the, amputated, the out, without the amputated limb. But with brain damage, consciousness itself is shattered. And we, the sufferers, are destined to spend our lives in a constant state of self-examination. Ever since my own life was thrown into chaos at 10 o'clock on the morning of October the 18th, 1973, when an artillery shell exploded by my trench and penetrated my brain. I've been circling around like a bat in the dark recesses of my dim consciousness, patching together a picture of a new world from scraps of the collision. And that was the context for you to describe the rehab. And if you can go into a little bit more detail, the kinds of things that you did in terms of work as opposed to miracle. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing, it took me years. People keep asking me, how did you make it? Um, and I keep saying, I don't know. But one thing I know, I was so terrified by the new situation I went into. I was married then, and Noga, my wife, told me that that she that she felt that I'm in a kind of hysterical state of hysteria. I felt that that I like and suddenly you wake up in the morning and there is nothing left from from anything in the world that you know. Nothing knows. I used to walk. I cannot walk. I used to um, identify, recognize people around me like my child, and I don't recognize them. And I used to no math, physics, things like that. And suddenly I just remember names. I, don't, I cannot do anything. I remember that once I was able to read, once I was able to write, suddenly it's not there. And, and uh, my, my response to that was very strong uh, fear. But, but here we are, you probably know about the three Fs in zoology, the, uh, the three basic behaviors of animals under stress, fight, flight, or freeze. These are called the three Fs in, in uh, zoology. And there is the ability to, fight, to escape, fly, f flee away from the situation or freeze. In my case, my response was to, to jump on the situation I was uh, facing, trying to break it or to, to succeed to, to gain again what I lost, but I did not understand what I'm doing. It was just, I can imagine it's a kind of an animal banging its head on the cage, trying to get out. And there was no, no logic or no cognitive control on what I was doing. This was kind of a automatic response. And now after years, when I start to understand what happens, and I th think that this is my response 
to the feeling that I'm not a, a human being anymore. In the book, I'm saying, what is a human being? In, in the end, what is a human being? But eating, by, by thinking and controlling uh, responses. And those two things I lost. A human, any animal is doing all of what we are doing, but one thing we are unique about, we are able to control our responses and we are able to think. And those two things I lost. And I felt that I lost it. And my luck in this case was that I did remember that once I was something. There are not, there are, I am working with lots of brain injured people today. And, and I can dis, you know, distinguish or make two groups out of them. This is the group of people who, who forgot what they were and people who remember what they were. Those who forgot what they were are maybe lucky because they don't remember anything and they can be very happy with what they are now. But I, I remember that once upon a time I was a human being. And that was a very frightening situation. It, and to me, maybe this is my Bulgarian background of very, uh, um, you know, people, simple people who are, are responding, simple but lively people. And so my reaction was was to try and solve the situation. I could not be to try and resolve the situation. I couldn't uh, uh, live with this feeling that that I'm doomed. And and then this response took me into this. A long it's a lifetime a journey of learning again from scratch. It was learning to walk, learning to, to orient myself, learning to write, read. Um, this is like every every moment in the city in my disability, every situation is a is an obstacle, is a challenge that you need to think how you solve it. Like even before this meeting, I had to think, how do I present these pictures? Because because of my limited vision, I don't see all the buttons on the monitor. I have to train myself before and and find figure the way to bypass my limitations. So to your question, Ian, uh, I, what you call miracle for me is just endless hard work. And it is um, in the book I describe very, in very meticulously, in much detail, uh, this long process of sitting hours and hours and just writing letter by letter. And then slowly, after hours and hundreds of hours like this, the letters became words and the words became meaningful only because of the act of hard work. Same thing for learning to walk again, learning to orient myself, to find my way. Uh, part of my injury has to do with the orientation. Uh, I was injured in the right side of the brain where the center of orientation is located. And slowly I found out that I'm losing my way everywhere I go which means every time you go somewhere, even entering a house that you never visited before, every time you need to think, how do I get out of here? Where is the way back? And, and this is the kind of place you always have to, to, to uh, control and prepare and be alert in what you are doing. Right. Um, I was intrigued by the way the book was written. It was written as narrative writing as opposed to historical writing. In other words, it's not a historical review of what happened, but it's a narrative story. And again, I want to read a quote from the book and then ask you to comment on it. I've been writing this story in my mind for decades, since the day I was declared dead. Like a nebula, it has been swirling around in my mind, 
finally coalescing into a lucid starry whole. This is not a historical document, but rather a story. I tell myself today, from a distance of almost 40 years, about my war and what happened when it was over. So if you can talk us through the way you did it, the way you write the story, the way you expressed your, your story. You see, the, the, the basic problem of a trauma is, and this is true for all traumas, it's, it can be a Holocaust, can be a war, can be a rape, anything, that the trauma is, is an event that if you let it control your life or manage your life, it becomes what we call a post-trauma. Post-trauma or post-traumatic person is a person who let the trauma enter his or her life and, and managing his life. Now, and part of, of the ability to cope with trauma and avoiding getting into, beco into becoming a post-traumatic person is to be able to tell yourself a good story about what happened. Because after the war, one of the things, and I think that many of you, if you have relatives from the Holocaust, for example, and we know that guilt feeling is a very basic feeling that many people from the Holocaust came with. Feeling guilty for being rescued or for surviving. I felt very guilty after the war. I didn't feel a hero. I felt that I was a loser. I was, when I went to the war, I, I was, I'm from the generation who was raised in Israel under the notion that we are supposed to sacrifice ourselves to the country. And I'm, I was such a kind of a person who was, we call it in Hebrew, Schwitzer. I don't know if you know the term in, in English. If any one of you knows it, tell, maybe you tell the rest what that means. Someone who is, who likes to show off to see how, to show how big of a hero he is. And I was a, one of that kind of people. And my wife actually told me, I was sure you're going to die in the war because uh, you always jump, you always try to show off. And, and then I was suddenly, this, I, and in the war, I realized that I am not willing to die. I'm not willing, and there was a situation that is described in that book, and we are welcome to read it, uh, that I describe how we, we, we are, entering an ambush and, and there, here is my big chance to die as a hero and I cannot do it. I can't, and I, I like most other people, I take a, a shelter. But this uh, revelation that I'm not a hero as I thought, it's a big uh, disappointment of myself and you feel very guilty for it. But when you write a book, and it took me for about 40 years to start, no, less, uh, 30 or something years for about, uh, to start uh, telling this story. The, the act of telling the story is act of, of relieving yourself from the pain, from the guilt, because a narrative story, unlike a historical story, a narrative story, story is mainly um, um, how do you say? Forces you. Sorry? Forces you. No, no, uh, the story is mechuyav, is devoted or is, it's historical, in historical story, you are, the reader expects you to describe the real facts. In a narrative story, the, the, you are expected to write something that is based on reality, on the facts, but it is uh, a kind of 
interpretation of yourself of the fact in which you grow up and becomes better than you entered. For example, uh, if you, Ian, if you read those two sections, the first paragraph and the last paragraph of the book, the one they sent you uh, this afternoon, that will illustrate. I'm coming to it. I'm coming but, to it. Yeah, yeah but I'm just, I will talk about it in a moment. Just imagine when you write a book about a big trauma that you suffer from, the moment, it took me about six years to write. The and the first paragraph of a book probably re reflects or represents the state of mind in which you enter the story. And the last paragraph reflects or represents the state of mind you end the story. And if there is a difference between those two, this re represents the changes that you went through, the emotional, psychological changes you went through during the writing process. And now, Ian, if you read those two paragraphs, can you? Yeah. This is the first paragraph, is the first paragraph of the book. Listen to it and think what it reflects or what it represents. Right, let me get there. Bear with me a second. The three memories. Yep. Yeah, but just the one. When I think, yeah, when I'm reading the first, literally the first paragraph. When I think back to the childhood of my two sons, I'm deeply saddened over the promises unkept, over not having known how to share my world with them, not being a father to them the way a father should be, calm, strong, upright, and confident, a rock to lean on, okay. and that's, always okay, lost that, no, that, Okay. That's it. So the, if you listen to this paragraph, it reflects a feeling that I'm not a good father. I was not a good father to my children. And that is the feeling I enter the story, writing the story. Now you read the last paragraph that describes my feelings in the end of the book after six years of writing. And it describes a small moment I return from daycare with my son. So before I read the paragraph, okay. I was gonna introduce it by saying the last thing that I wanted to touch on was this idea that you went from a bad father to a good father through yeah, this whole process. So the first part of the extract I was going to read was exactly that, the, the bad father not having to cope. And then, of course, this is the last paragraph. Okay. You come up to me and you put your little hand in mine and say, Daddy, I'm hungry. Let's go inside. With your hand in mine, we walk into the apartment and shut the door behind us. I watch you and Sharon as you cheerfully play. The house is flooded with light and I feel it is. Soon Noga will be home from her studies and we'll all sit down for dinner. The, the first paragraph of the book represent a feeling that I was a bad father. And the, fa the father that I regard as a good father is a rock, a very muscular, macho father. The last paragraph of the book describes a mother. I am being, I describe myself as a mother to my son. We come back home from daycare, from the kindergarten, and he says, I'm hungry, and I make food for him. I prepare food for him. This is a mother, if you want a change, of in, inside a human being while writing a book about his feelings as on trauma he passed through, this is the change from a bad to a good father, from a, a macho father to a mother-like father, if you want. And this is, what hap this is what happens when you are willing to move from a documentary uh, writing to a narrative writing in which you tell a story, it's not exactly 100% 
as it happened, but when you read it again, you feel stronger. You feel that you have changed. And the story itself changes you. The act of writing changes you. And that is what I wanted to say about their narrative writing, which was a way to change uh, uh, my, to build a new cognition, a new understanding to write a story about what happened to me. Because a human being without a story is not a human being. Every human being has a story. When you say, I'm an idiot, you tell a story about yourself. When you say, I'm a hero, I'm a war hero, you tell a story. This is the way you perceive yourself. Now, I did not feel a war hero until today, I don't think so. But I felt that I learned in the book, I say, I am a hero of life, not hero of death. And this is something that you learn to tell yourself a story about yourself and to stand behind it. This is the, the, the big gift of writing, of spending years on writing such narrative book. Excuse me, that should have been on. That's just in case we had any technical problems that we haven't got. Um, can I go back now to a little bit more detail of the rehab itself? Because okay. the fact of the work, and I think that's the key here, that this isn't a miracle in the sense that you wake up and you find. One of the things that struck me in the book as well is the focus on the individual doctors who worked with you. Some you liked, some you didn't like, some were nice, some were horrible is the way it comes through. And then I didn't know one of the things that you mentioned to me was that that's not their real names. And you gave them names that were something else. So if you could talk a little bit more in the detail of how you had to work and the hard work that was put, which comes out very clearly in the book, but it's worthwhile mentioning it in your, in your, in your, in your terms with us now, if you can. Um, let me understand. You, I, I'm not sure I understood what is the question. Yeah. What do you want to know about the names of the doctors? No, 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 no. I just mentioned that as an aside. Wow. The detail of the hard work, for example, when you say, and you just re, you know, glossed over the fact that you wrote letter by letter, I know from reading the book how many hours it took. And, I don't, and people need to understand the fact that you had a blank sheet of paper, for want of a better example, that you had to put all your past knowledge and experiences back into or new ones. How do you cope with that day to day? dealing as i said i don't have a, um, i don't have a, um, you know, a scientific response to that but uh, but i have to myself when i ask myself how it happened and i slowly realize that something big happened there uh, which is kind of extraordinary but um, i i think to my, when I think of it, it I used to say it is mainly the the willingness, willing the readiness to work extremely hard. There is no limit in terms of how much time you uh, you are, you should devote in order to succeed. You and just give you an example. When I started to study in the university, I. I was planning to study geology when I was working in the field school in the Society for the Protection of Nature. And then when I woke up in the hospital, the first thing I said when I, was, I started to speak, I said, I want to study geology without understanding that, that I cannot study geology. And then a few, a few months later, when I was in rehab, in rehabilitation, I was a registered student for geology. And, and, and that was, and there was a teacher of the geologists that used to come to me and teach me what he taught the, the geologists, the students, and, and I could not understand anything. When we, when finally he came, we managed, we ended up 
in trying to, to do some basic arithmetic of, of third grades, and they couldn't do it, he said to me, I think geology is too much for you for the time being. It was a big uh, crisis for me, so I, but I didn't stop it and I went to archeology span and um, which is, if you think of it, it's about the same thing, archeology span and geology, both you, you reconstruct the past by using physical evidence like ceramic plates, pieces or stones or fossils. Um, but anyway, I finished my bachelor degree in archeology span at the same time, I was also doing a teacher certificate. And, and six years later, I started geology again. I don't know why, I don't know how. One day I went to the university and asked what I should do in order to become a geologist. And they were nice enough to admit me back. And I had to start again from scratch, studying geology, with, which is math, physics, all the, things like that. And something came slowly recovered. I don't know why and how, but after three years, I finished uh, my studies and I started a master's degree. And my, my professor was American, he came to live in Israel and left the country. And I, I had to go to the United States to complete my thesis under his supervision. So I, I went there for four months and a month later, a um, month after coming there, there was some kind of a crisis at home in Israel and I had to go back. And I said to myself, I'm saying it as an example of what it means to work nonstop. I said to myself, you don't go back, you finish it. And then, I made a calculation. I had what, about 100 pages to finish writing. And I wanted to go back home, not in four months, but in three weeks. So then it means you have to write five pages every day. So every day I never I stopped. I was writing five pages, giving them to my supervisor in the evening. He was reading them in the evening, giving it back to me with his comments, then I used to retype them on a typewriter. Again, this is back in 1982, typing them back and then writing five more pages. And I finished it in two and a half weeks. And this for me is an example of you, you have a, a mission and assignment, you don't do it, you don't stop before you finish. And ever since then, Ever, ever since I started to gain my consciousness, I used to work like this. For example, I was sitting in, when I studied archeology, span sitting in the lecture room, I could not write. So I asked a, a student to give me, to make, to have a carbon paper right under her uh, uh, summaries under oh, her, her paper. So in the end of the lecture, I have her summaries. But then I was sitting all night to summarize her summaries. So I have my own copy, but this is taking me hours and hours because I could hardly write and I could hardly read. This is to tell you that all what I do all what I gain, got, in my opinion, it's a result of very hard work and lots of creativity. Um, it means you have to, to invent lots of kind of bypasses in order to succeed, to do things that your brain cannot do otherwise. I just have to say, um, I have a, uh, two professorships today, uh, one in geology and one in learning sciences. And I was working for 10 years in a, as a scientist of a computer company, we developed uh, a learning software for children. And, um, and, I, and I, I don't know how it comes, how it goes, but I think I have curiosity and willingness to work very hard 
And that is the only thing I can offer as an explanation to, to what happened. But being um, in touch with so many brain, people with brain injuries, I'm aware of the fact that it's not, it is really not uh, trivial to be with, to be in my situation. Just let me tell you a small anecdote. A small anecdote. Um, I was tested in Birmingham. The, in Birmingham, there is a big research, brain research center, and I was going there to be tested uh, in my brain. Some kind of things about the kind of recovery I had, and uh, when they, they sent the papers for uh, in a journal. And uh, and the, and in the background of the of the patient, me, they mentioned that I'm a professor, and the paper was rejected, and because they they also and they also attached my CT in the picture of my brain into the paper, and the paper was rejected because the editor said that uh, a man with such a CT is not able to be to function as a professor in a university. If you check on Google Scholar, uh, the patient YE, this is me. Uh, this is the paper that was rejected, but uh, but in the end, they managed to prove that uh, I am a real person. But for me, it was yeah, it was kind of. Uh, um, another indication in the situation that yes, there was kind of what you call a miracle, what I call a hard work and and willingness to to live, you know, to function. Uh, that's perfect timing because what we want to do now is open up for people's comments or questions. There's just one thing I'd like to add because another word that comes to mind in my lexicon after hearing you, right? And that's the word inspiration. Besides miracle that we don't believe in miraculous. And, but inspiration is another word that absolutely springs out from this. So we've got 10 minutes now, Steve. Uh, hopefully you've been collating comments or questions that people might have. So please, if you'd like to uh, ask the questions to Yoram. Uh, hi. Hi, Yoram. Thank you for um, sharing your, your story with us. Uh, it, you know, we, we've had a few messages here. Um, I want to read one from someone by the name of Spencer Gelding, um, who writes here, Yoram, thank you for sharing your story tonight. You are a truly remarkable man. I had, <clears throat> excuse me, I had the pleasure of meeting you in Israel through my work with Beit HaLochem, and remember this meeting well. I wish you only good health and happiness. Um, and Another one, uh, we just other people saying how inspirational you are um, and what a man, Kola Kabod, with health always. So um, thank you for sharing sharing your remarkable story with us. Um, Yoram, I have a question. And sorry, forgive me if I have, if you've already addressed it, um, but I've been busy in the background doing some other things as well for the ZF. Um, how long had you? How long had you been? Um, how 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 far into the Yom Kippur War were you when you when you were injured? How long? You mean how much time? It yes. Be? No. How much time had you been in service during the in the Yom Kippur War? When when before you before you got your before the war you... started in october 6th and i was in the injured in october 18th so right 12, a couple of weeks mm. 12 days um only the three or four last days were really uh, in continuous combat uh, after we crossed the canal right uh, mm, yeah okay what i wanted to add maybe uh, maybe it's a moment should I would like to to add that if you don't mind something that I wanted to say about uh, what happens to people after a trauma is the first thing is that they are being muted to the experience like 
People come from the Holocaust, people come from a war. They are not able to communicate about their experience. They are muted to it. And even, and, and even if their family members approach them and are interested in what, they, what happened to them, they are not able to, to communicate with those with people about it. There is a feeling, I cannot explain what happened to me. The book that I am talking about or it was originally called Stories I Could Not Tell My Children. That was my basic uh, uh, idea, I think, when I wrote the book. I want to tell them what happened, but in fact, I wanted to tell myself or to stop being muted to this experience. And if you, if you want, or you, if it's possible, you can read from the third memory in the book, uh, if you have time for that, only these lines that my son comes to me and asks me, my son is now, he was two years old in, when I was injured, but now he is in the, in the army, in one of the elite troops in the army. And he asks himself, what did my father do in the war? And here he comes to his father, to me, and ask me what I really wanted so much that somebody will ask me. And if Ian will read it to you, yeah. you, you will be able to get the idea of what, why such a book is so important to be able to talk to your family. You need to tell me where, I'm gonna, where I can find it. It's uh, the third memory. Yep, I've got the third memory, but where? Uh, um, I'll tell you. Uh, my, my son is standing in near, it's, um, in my second, uh, where is it? It's in page, should be in page nine. Oh, page eight in the bottom. In my third memory, you are a soldier. Yes, I can't got it. Yep, I can't got it. In my third memory, you are a soldier home on leave. Mommy's out and your brother Shaul is playing the piano in his room. I am standing in the dimly lit kitchen of our Jerusalem home, perusing some notes stuck to the refrigerator. You come up behind me and ask apologetically, Dad, did you kill anyone in the war? Your question delivers a punch. I've waited so many years for this salvation, for you to open the heavy locked door that I cannot open alone. To ask me about what happened there. But I turn around and shout. That's not something to joke about. Your slender shoulders droop. Your face recoils in insult. And the narrow crack through which you sought to glimpse my inner workings slam shut, never to reopen. Defeated and angry, I shoulder my sack of guilty memories and withdraw into my old habits. The gates of mercy were closed on that day. And there were no more questions about what happened in the war? Ever since I've been trying to reach you, lying in wait for another miracle. Today with you on the other side of the world and time fast running out, I ask myself if I could have, if it could have been different, I still have no answer. I think this was, uh, this section was important to illustrate the, the urgent need to communicate with myself and by doing that to communicate with my family. And if you read the book, you'll see how it continued to communicate with my wife who was my second hand in, in writing the book. In fact, the act of writing, when I was writing, she was helping me by being a critical reader of what I'm writing. 
and giving me comments. And she refused completely to talk about what happened when, before I was writing. So the act of writing was in fact, in the act of communicating between us on, on what happened. And that is, I think, was important to, to um, say that about the importance of getting ownership of what happened and using the act of writing to, to uh, regain my life, my family life. Uh, yeah. Okay. If sorry. I could just briefly before we hand back is there's so much we haven't touched upon. We've literally just scratched the surface of what the story is about. And I urge people, this is a book that is absolutely a must for people to read. Thank you once again for sharing. I think you've heard what, what, what people have felt and it's truly been inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Yoram, I've got a, another couple of, of questions that I'd like to just put to you. Um, have you been able to help other IDF soldiers to rehabilitate soldiers who may have sustained, um, who suffered similar injuries to yourself? Yeah, I, I in constant touch, in touch with uh, IDF soldiers who, be, who veterans who were hit in the brain, but not only IDF, uh, also people with brain injury. Mm -hmm. I, the years taught me how to communicate with people on their disaster, on their, uh, the bad event they suffer. If you want one day, we can talk about this, but this is not, it will take hours. I learned how to approach people who suffer such a situation. And yes, I'm working with uh, quite many, I'm talking about long, long range work. It's like years, there are some yeah. of them I'm in touch for already 15, 20 years. But you're saying also in civil society, not just within the IDF? No, yes. Yes, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, another question here uh, starts off as a statement that how your determination uh, to live productively is, is truly remarkable. So when writing in the way that you described that, that that you described, how many hours sleep did you manage to get each night? <laughs> I don't know. I don't sleep much also because of pain. But mm. I don't think it's a question of hours of sleeping. I think it's a question what I learned if you plan your, your time, uh, you can do lots of things. Because I was all my career, I was working at two places at the same time, like computer company and the researcher in the geological survey. And you have to be in control on your, on your time and what you do. I work with plans, I admit. I'm a little obsessive, this is true. But you need to do that. I think I have uh, the traits of a tip of a, the, the successful brain uh, injury person injured person because you need to be uh, being afraid of of uh, failing i'm very i i can't uh, i can't suffer failing that's a problem today when i'm 71 i begin to be more relaxed but I, it's hard for me to admit that I did not succeed. And, and this means it gives you much energy to try again and try again until something happens. But the way, on the way you spend lots of energy, you sacrifice lots of your family life or personal leisure time. I don't know what leisure time is. I'm not so much so good at, you know, at wasting time. Uh, by the way, I wrote another book uh, a year ago, two years ago, I published another, this time it's a novel called uh, Tamar Labor Pain. It's about two uh, bereaved women, two women who lost their children. And this was one of the lessons I took from those tens of years is the understanding and the, the ability to look at the pains of other people. And this one is the 
on the journey of two women who lost their children, which is for me uh, the the ultimate pain that a human being can suffer to lose a child. And uh, and but, but again, it is about the same experience I describe in this book, the, A Man Walks Home, is the experience of what does a human being do when one day he wakes up in the morning and finds out that there's nothing left in life. I mean, do you give up or you continue struggling until something happens? The problem with brain injury, because you don't know, is the, pro the problem is that you don't know, there is no guarantee that something will happen. You only do what you can. Because if you have an amputation, the doctors will give you a good, reliable uh, forecast of what you will be able to do if you work hard or not or whatever. With a brain injury, there is no, there is nothing you can, no prognosis can be given to you. The only thing is you should do two things. And that's what I keep telling uh, people that come to me and ask, seek for advice. I don't know. I don't have the, 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 the I'm not a prophet, but I only, I know one thing. If you work hard and try and try and try, there is a chance that something will happen. There is no guarantee that it will happen. But if you do nothing, that's for sure nothing will happen. That's my very, lesson. very wise words from you. Um, very inspirational for all of us here. Um, we overwhelmingly inspirational. Um, Kolakavod, the work you do, you know, for others is is amazing. Um, thank you so much for giving us, you know, the briefest of insights into into your journey. It's it's really been inspirational, Ian. Thank you for um, for, for for moderating with with your um, this evening. Um, to all of you, thank you for for joining us. Thank you for taking time out. Um, as I said earlier, you know, Chag Sameach, Chag Hanukkah Sameach to all of you who, who celebrate. Um, and if you'd like to rejoin us tomorrow evening, we have another webinar where we will hear from Dr. Tuvia Book all about the all about the behind the scenes on the UN partition plan vote, whose anniversary was just a few days ago on the 29th of November in 1947. Um, when the UN General Assembly voted in favour of the establishment of a Jewish state um, in, in Eretz Yisrael. So, so that's tomorrow at um, 6.30pm. So do consider joining us. I'll send you all details in the morning. Um, I'll also send you details of Yoram's uh, two books. And thank you very much, everyone. Chag Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Dorian, bye-bye. Shalom, shalom to you. Toda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you.